Okay, can I have your attention, please? We'll be uh, starting off the lecture momentarily. I'd like to welcome uh, everybody this evening on behalf of the sponsors, which are the Concordia University Helsinki Monitors, Spotlight USSR, the Concordia University Russian Studies Students Union, the Concordia University Students Association Human Rights Lecture Series, and the Concordia University Visiting Lectures Committee. Vladimir Bukovsky received his education at Moscow State University, Cambridge University. He worked at the Moscow Center of Cybernetics and was arrested for possessing banned literature in 1963, where he was confined to Leningrad Psychiatric Prison Hospital for 15 months. In 1965, Mr. Bukovsky was arrested for demonstrating on behalf of Soviet writers and was confined to eight months in psychiatric institutions. For his efforts in the area of civil rights, he received a sentence of three years corrective labor. In 1971, Mr. Bukowski was arrested for delivering information on psychiatric abuse to the West and was subsequently sentenced to two years in prison, five years in a labor camp, and five years in exile. Following a worldwide campaign for his release, Vladimir Bukowski was exchanged for Chilean Communist Party leader Louis Corvalan in Zurich in December of 1976. Since, a, since his arrival to the West, Mr. Bukowski has done research work in the area of neurosciences. He is an honorary member of several human rights organizations and has published a number of articles and books which include A Manual on Psychiatry for Dissenters, to, Biz to Build a Castle, My Life as a Dissenter, The Peace Movement in the Soviet, Wo Soviet Union, as well as others. Currently, Mr. Bukowski is writing a book dealing with the prospects of changes in the Soviet Empire. So, following Mr. Bukowski's lecture, there will be a uh, short question and answer period on uh, in the two aisles on my left and on my right, there are two microphones. I would ask those people who have questions to approach, to approach the microphones. And for the second segment of the uh, lecture, Jim Locke, the president of the Russian Studies Students Union, will be uh, overseeing the uh, question and answer period. So now, without any further ado, I'd like to present to you Mr. Vladimir Bukowski. Um, whenever we speak about the human rights in the Soviet Union, human rights violations in the Soviet Union, uh, it, it always uh, becomes sometimes very misleading. It always becomes misleading because uh, it somehow equates the Soviet Union, the other communist parties, with uh, other authoritarian regimes where indeed there are some violations of human rights too. And it makes very misleading picture. People sometimes too easy to uh, compare the two systems on the basis of them both having some violations of human rights. Uh, I think when we speak about the Soviet Union and many other communist countries, it's not so much of a question of human rights as a question of a totalitarian system, which is much more uh, deep and much more serious. Uh, in order to find the distinction, in order to understand it, we have to uh, go slightly back to history and discuss a bit of what happened to that country. I will try to be as short as possible because the subject is endless and one can speak several days on it. Uh, but at least some basic main factors should be given to uh, understand the basic distinction. Well, in any non-free, non-democratic country with, a, uh, with dictatorial regimes, uh, people speak about terror, about fear being one of the factors of their life. But the fear also can be different. Let me tell you uh, a very popular joke, which was used to be very popular in the Soviet Union at the time when I was there, which just gives you some comparison of what might be different kinds of fear. The joke was about uh, Brezhnev and Nixon sitting in Paris in Eiffel Tower restaurant and discussing between themselves whose people are more loyal and more ready to sacrifice their life for the motherland. Uh, and they decided to make an experiment. So they invited their own drivers up to the tower. And Nixon said to his driver, well, Jim, whatever his name, uh, just show to these commies that we Americans that really, we really love our country, we are ready to sacrifice anything for the sake of our nation, show it to them, jump, jump from this tower. 
I saw the man looked down, looked on Nixon and said, I'm sorry, Mr. President, I'm not going to do that. I'm too scared. I love my country, but I cannot do that. I have my wife, I have kids. It's too, it's too scary. Then Brezhnev invited his driver and said, Comrade Ivanov, now for the sake of our socialist fatherland, you're supposed to jump from this tower. Do that. Show it to these young kids. The man looked down and jumped. He was lucky enough to be caught by his dress somewhere in between, so he survived and was surrounded by the press, and the press asked him questions. Why did you do that? Didn't you know that you would be killed in the process? And he said, what could I do? I have family, I have kids, I have wife. <laughs> That gives a certain distinction that fear and fear could be quite different. <laughs> the, Soviet system, the Soviet system operates in such a way that the, deep, the, the fear becomes so much ingrained in the people that it becomes so, sort of a qualifying characteristic of people's behavior, even if they don't understand it. It will use the hostages, uh, I mean the families of the people as their hostages routinely, as it, and, and indeed the whole countries could become hostages in the, in the Soviet politics. Um, there are different types of terror. To understand what happened with the countries like Soviet Union, one should understand that it wasn't just a terror during 60 odd years uh, aimed at destroying enemies or potential enemies. It was a scientifically organized terror. Uh, according to the ideological doctrine, the Marxism-Leninism, certain stratas of societies were supposed to be destroyed. Not because they were enemies or could be enemies, but because uh, the society had to be restructured in order to embark on the way to socialism. So those who were perceived to be belonging to different classes, or sometimes the whole nations, became destroyed in the process. To understand how deep this uh, kind of a terror went, let me tell you my impression when I just came to the West in 1976, and the first country where I was was Switzerland, where we exchanged with my family. And I remember walking in the streets of Zurich, seeing so many faces, and being puzzled that there are some totally different types of people. Not only different expressions, but different types, genetically different types of a people which I never encountered in the Soviet Union in my life. Later, I've got a kind of album of old photographs of pre-revolutionary pre Russia, and indeed there were faces like that in that uh, old album. So it means that it was a genocide, it was so, certain ge genetical types of people wiped out in a country. That is important to remember when we speak about the, the issue which is broadly called human rights violations in the Soviet Union because I believe it goes far beyond the idea of human rights. It's just extermination thing. Totalitarian state is different from any kind of a state. It's not like a, a, a dictatorial state where there is a person, a dictator. It's a system which is ruled by ideology and things are done in this country according to certain ideological doctrines. Uh, they structured accordingly, they governed accordingly, the, the, the punishment and reward goes accordingly, the social structures are made accordingly. It's totally different. Uh, to understand that, let me say that one of the important characteristics of a Soviet society, which influenced a lot of people, is the change of history which it introduces. Uh, as I think Orwell said once, those who control history control the future. That's exactly how the Soviet society operates. You never know what will be tomorrow's version of our, f of our past. As, as they say in the Soviet Union, the only thing we are sure of is the future. The past is discussable, the, the present is unclear, the future is given to us. So that, and that's a very important thing also, because if, if nothing else, it's a terrorizing factor too. Now, the, the all, all present propaganda, which is... Uh, it's not just uh, an expression of one view given by one part of a people. It's something which utilizes all the media in your country. Let it be books, movies, libraries, journals, magazines, anything. Uh, and it, 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 you have nothing else but that. And it always repeats the same messages, whatever the message might, must be important at that time for the Soviet authorities. It's. Um, Sometimes, and quite often, it is stupid, it's absurd. It goes in circles, repeating the same things which are obviously wrong. 
for anybody who lives in the Soviet society, obviously it couldn't be true. Uh, yet it will insist on repeating these things. I always was, in the past I was puzzled, why they do that? Till it just occurred to me that it, uh, it's a very good manifestation of their power. Once they can continue to repeat even absurd things, insisting on them, it shows to the people that no logic can actually change this power. You cannot appeal to logic, to mercy, to, to common sense, to anything. They will do what they want, and you remember that. One of the important notions of the Soviet propaganda, and indeed the organization of life, is the uh, conditioning to what we call in psychology learned helplessness. Now, that is a phenomenon known to the experimental psychology. Uh, if you take an animal and put it into experimental chamber, and in this chamber uh, administer to the animal continuous punishments without giving him any way to escape, in due time after these experiments, the animal, the same animal, placed in a chamber where there is an escape, would never try to escape. And that's what they seem to introduce into the system. Those who try to run away from the Soviet Union are considered to be traitors. Even those defectors who managed to run away would be now and then found abroad and murdered. Why would the Soviet authorities care to do that? For a very simple reason. It's a message back home. There is no escape from this system either physical or mental. And that's also a very important factor of the terror. Since it's ideological totalitarian system, it's not only people required uh, to be silent on a certain subject. It's not only a censorship. It's more of a positive side. People are supposed to repeat the cliches of propaganda. And they're supposed to do it, to do it cheerfully. If they're not cheerful enough, it's also some kind of disloyalty to the state. The, in literature, it's also become not just a censorship as we know in some dictatorial countries where the censor would cut down one or another piece and leave it as it is. No, it's different. The people are supposed to come up and create exactly what the state wants. And if they don't create it in a positive sense, then they are not going to be promoted or having any, any advancement in their life. So what they try to create is a kind of a no-choice situation or a, more often the situation in which the present stage of affairs is viewed by the people as a lesser evil. Uh, the Soviet people by and large are conditioned to notion that any change is going to be only to the worse and not to the better. Uh, and that's, a, that's the ultimate uh, 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 target of the Soviet propaganda. Uh, I remember another joke in that connection uh, about two guys, I mean, it illustrates very well the people's perception, and the joke is very popular, about two guys being sentenced to death, uh, and they sh were supposed to be executed next morning. And one guy says, well, let's try to escape. And another says, wouldn't it be worse if we try? Wouldn't it become even worse for us? And that's, that's, that's kind of attitude and mentality which the Soviet system tries to create in their people. It also, of course, creates a trauma. When you hear one thing and see totally opposite, and you have to sort of be, uh, sort of be calm and uh, sort of accept it as it is, it creates any, any textbook of medical psychology will tell you, it creates a trauma inside of man. Uh, and this trauma could be resolved by human being in different ways. Sometimes it results more common, most common escape reaction in the Soviet Union is alcoholism. So you suddenly have millions of people becoming alcoholics as a result of it. In other escape reactions might be like, well, like a political jokes they always tell to each other. That's another sort of a discharge, an escape reaction from this trauma, from this discrepancy. Uh, but more common, uh, people will be living in some kind of a schizophrenic state when they think one thing, say another, and do the third. And that, that is a state of, uh, of mentality people have to live with. How much do they believe in propaganda which is administered to them? I think, by and large, people want to believe it. It's not a question of their inability to understand that it's a propaganda and therefore lies. It's their in desire to understand it. Because if they do, then they're confronted with necessity, a very uncomfortable necessity of doing something, of acting somehow. And as long as they can persuade themselves that uh, what they hear is correct, as long as they can do that, they can maintain a certain comfort, a certain comfortable position for themselves. Um, 
Because they want to believe in these things, people very often create a lot of self-justifications to somehow explain to themselves, to, to feel uh, satisfied and at the same time to fit into this odd schizophrenic system. And these self-justifications, particularly among intellectuals, sometimes are very funny, sometimes are uh, incredible, uh, but they are probably the most powerful weapon on which the whole thing is built. Some people, most common reaction, most, most common self-justification people use is uh, something like, uh, well, what can I do alone? If others will, then I would. Another might be, uh, particularly among the intellectuals, the military might be, well, I'm not working for communists, I'm working for Russia. As if there is a difference between the two and you can differentiate one from another, you cannot. But therefore, nevertheless, people will do that in order to create a, some kind of a micro world inside and, and feel themselves satisfied and not at odds with themselves. Uh, or some others would say, well, we understand everything perfectly, but it wouldn't do any good to protest on, or, or to, to try to change it. We should wait and try to sort of climb up on the hierarchy in the Soviet Union. And once we reach the top, then we will do something. And of course, those of them who embark on this way, in due time, lose all their naivety and become so much involved in, in the doing of a state that they uh, never try to do anything, even if they manage to climb to the very top. There are hundreds and hundreds of these self-justifications. One I've heard from religious people, and it also gives people comfort and justification. They would say, well, communism was sent to Russia as a punishment by God, and therefore it will be sinful to protest against that. There are hundreds of them. But, uh, of course, the system, as any totalitarian system, uses this internal world of self-justification to govern it even more uh, successfully, even more efficiently. Uh, for the sake of doing it easier, they will divide the functions of a state, particularly the oppressive functions, to a minuscule functions in itself, each, each of which does not constitute a real repression. Let me just, to, to explain that uh, notion, let me give an example of a man I've met in concentration camp long ago. Uh, the man was accused and imprisoned for probably 25, 30 years for mass murder of Jews during World War II. And the guy would vehemently argue, saying, no, I, I didn't commit any mass murders. My job was on, only to open the door to gas chamber. Somebody's other was the job to close it. So I, am personally, was not involved in it. And that's how the state divides its functions for each of the people being involved in the crimes of the state without feeling a guilt, creating what we call the collective irresponsibility instead of personal responsibility. The, if you wish, the whole Soviet society is built in such a way. Well, tell me, if you can, what's the difference between um, a man who manufactures the barbed wire and a man who guards the concentration camp? Who is more guilty of them? If you accept the uh, sort of equal complicity of these two, those who manufacture iron in a country surely contribute to manufacturing bar barbed wire, or, wire or, or handcuffs or whatever. We all are employees of the state, whether we like it or not. So whatever we do is contributing to the state with its own purposes, with its own ideology, which we, we do not share. So whether we like it or not, we become accomplices. In the, in the crimes of the state, even if we're simply silent instead of being uh, vociferous. Uh, I think this explanation leads us very well to the origination of dissident movement in early 60s, because the dissident uh, dissent as such was exactly a response to this idea, to this system of a collective complicity in the state. Uh, the death of Stalin, which occurred in 1953, have shocked a lot of people. We suddenly learned from Khrushchev, from his speech in 20th Party Congress, and from the rumors and knowledge which was circulated around, that this country had murdered some millions and millions of innocent people, while all the rest were either taking active part in it or passive part in it. They were either required to um, take part in demonstration approving the, the party policy or uh, just to uh, vote in the meetings of workers, vote approving the policy in internal affairs or external affairs, and they were all made to be accomplices. That feeling of complicity 
through inactivity, through silence, through acceptance, was very strong, particularly in my generation, which was quite young at that time. We understood that that's exactly a way to become involved in crimes, in crimes of, of mass murder in a country, of crimes of oppression. It was also reinforced once again in 56 when the Soviet Union occupied Hungary. And that was a big shock for us as well because some people believed once the Stalinism was condemned by Khrushchev and by top leadership, the things like that would never be repeated again. Yet, within a few years, you had exactly the same thing as it used to be before, repeated by this uh, uh, supposedly new government of Khrushchev with the same atrocities and with the same consequences. For people of my generation, for, for many people I believe in that time, for our generation I, I think in particular, it was a question of choice, a very simply formulated choice. You either become involved in mass murder or you run the risk of being murdered. So what would you prefer? In, in, in my uh, knowledge, a lot of people prefer to be rather murdered than to go and be involved in the crimes of the state. We also understood that when they try to create a situation of no choice, it's wrong. The most important notion we've uh, created for ourselves was the freedom of choice. That we're always free to choose. The, the consequences of this choice might be uh, very uh, severe. The payment for this choice might be quite serious. But nevertheless, the choice is yours. You're still free to make it. That's how this movement organized itself. Uh, that's how it started. It had purely moral grounds and no political ambitions at all. It was a movement of people who believed they don't want to belong to this system. They don't want to become involved in it. Uh, there was a, a small episode during the 20th Party Congress which is quite sort of illustrative of, of that notion. After uh, Khrushchev of Red's very famous uh, speech in the 20th Party Congress, as they say, he received a note from the audience and he read that note over the microphones. Who, uh, where, where you had been personally, Comrade Khrushchev, when all these crimes had been committed? And he looked into the audience and said, who have written this note? Please stand up. And there was a silence in the hall and nobody stood up. So he said, I had been exactly in the place where you're sitting right now. <laughs> now, that kind of answer was uh, perceived as satisfactory by many people, but it was not satisfactory for the younger generation because if you are uh, in this hall, you're already an accomplice to it. If you are not brave enough to stand up and to be counted, you shouldn't be that close to the power and to decision making. It just showed to us how tight this vicious circle of complicity became. I remember very vividly in, uh, in the late 50s and early 60s when all these facts of uh, repressions became known, how people reacted, the people of all the generation, most of them would say they didn't know anything about it. Some of them would say, yes, we knew, but we were too scared to say anything, and what's the use of it, and what could I do alone, and all the rest of it. And that, of course, was once again showing to us that the only correct way to do that, as we did, was not to be a part of the system and to protest whenever we can, even if we don't have a clear objective in this protest, even if we know, we knew that this protest wouldn't achieve anything. It was needed more for us than for anybody else. That period was known as a Khrushchevian saw. Uh, I wouldn't call it Khrushchevian saw. Uh, it, it, it was more of, a, it had very little with Khrushchev to do. It was more of a change in attitude in the people. The people felt more inclined, more hopeful, more inclined to change something, more inclined to try uh, the limits given to them. And the authorities didn't know exactly what they can do and what they cannot do because the usual limits imposed in Stalin time were lost. Uh, the mass terror of Stalin time terminated on its own. I wouldn't really say that it was terminated by Khrushchev or anybody in particular. It simply exhausted itself on a, on a logic of any mass terror when it becomes un ungovernable. Uh, to illustrate you the story, the, the, uh, uh, the reason why it became ungovernable and how it operates in the atmosphere created during the Great Terror, let me tell you a story of a man whom I also met uh, in, in jail at one point, who was uh, 
arrested in Suris. He was a military man, a colonel in the armor. And he was accused of being a spy for imperialism, Japanese imperialism, American, British imperialism, all kinds of imperialism. And uh, uh, the only thing the authorities wanted from him is to tell who had hired him, who were the other agents who involved him into this sort of subversive activity. And of course, he, uh, he didn't want to give any names of his friends. I mean, they, they clearly demanded from him the names of other military people to be also arrested on false accusations. Uh, he he uh, tried to endure the torture as, as long as he could, but he was scared that at one point, under the torture, being sort of broken, he would sign some paper or do something which would be beyond his control and then would regret it all his life because he would uh, sort of accuse uh, falsely some other people. So in one of these sessions of interrogation, which was conducted by three interrogators, one uh, senior and two junior, when he felt like uh, being very close to losing the ca control over himself, he said, pointing to the senior interrogator, you have hired me. Yes, you have hired me in 1933 in so and so place. The man said, well, he's, he's mad, he's, uh, he has a hallucination, remove him. But two junior interrogators said, no, it's very interesting, let him talk. <laughs> and it's, it's a true story. And uh, the next day or the next session, the senior interrogator disappeared and one of the junior interrogators have taken over of the job. So uh, you, you can understand that atmosphere of that kind cannot continue for very long because in due time, uh, the leadership of a party became vulnerable, the two-thirds of party itself became destroyed, nobody felt secure. So as soon as uh, their poems, sometimes uh, totally innocent, totally harmless, apolitical poems will be distributed in such a way, then something more, uh, uh, more clear in political uh, sense will be also distributed. And that's how the thing started. It was enormously important for the country where people did not trust each other. It was not that much of a text of these things, than uh, a distribution factor. Once you gave to somebody a material and he didn't denounce you to KGB, you can trust him. Before, you couldn't know whom you can trust and whom you cannot. People don't know themselves, actually, how much they can trust themselves. So that was what I call the establishment of channels of trust in the society, which was uh, a process in the 50s, early 60s, which we appreciated much later, the importance of which we appreciated much later. When in the uh, uh, middle of 60s, the authorities decided to uh, increase the repressions and try to clamp down on all these kind of uh, liberal tendencies in the society, uh, particularly on, on uh, uh, artists and, and writers, then we suddenly learned that we're dealing with a totally new society, or at least to a, considerably, to a considerable part a new society. It so happened that in 1965, the authorities trying to clamp down all these liberal tendencies have arrested two writers, Sinyavsky and Daniel, for publishing their works of uh, literature abroad under the pseudonyms. They were accused of uh, creating anti-Soviet agitation and propaganda and put on trial. And suddenly that created the public outburst. The public felt that it's time for them to protest and not to allow a return of Stalin time back. Uh, not only there were numbers and numbers, hundreds of uh, written protests distributed in the same channels of some as that, as it used to be for poetry, but we also decided to make a first demonstration in Moscow. That was a very experimental thing. The demonstrations uh, of uh, non-government or not, not communist demonstrations or uh, anti-governmental variety of demonstrations did not occur in the Soviet Union since 1927. So we were dealing with totally new thing and nobody could predict what will happen. There were different notions, different uh, uh, opinions of the people who took part in it, some would say, well, they will shoot us all. They will just come up with machine guns and shoot us down. Others would say, well, no, they wouldn't. They probably will arrest few. So nobody knew. Uh, and it was scheduled to be on December 5th of 1965. Uh, at, that, uh, at 6 o'clock uh, of the evening in a certain square in Moscow, uh, the square at that time presented a very strange picture. There was a small group of people in the center of the square who decided to risk it all. They were standing in front, uh, in, in, in the center, without knowing what will happen. And there was a huge number of people, thousands of them, 
on another side of streets watching what will happen to this handful of people. Uh, the, the slogans were very modest. The slogans, because we ourselves didn't know what will happen, and we tried to be as reserved as we can, and, you know, without violating any obvious laws. So the slogans will be something like, respect your own constitution. Or uh, uh, we, we demand the open trial on Sinevsky and Daniel, as opposed to closed, but that, that would be, you know, sounding very neutral and sort of difficult to argue against. Well, in due time, of course, within a few minutes, as soon as this group gathered in the center, uh, the plain clothes KGB rushed into the crowd and turned down the, the slogans and uh, grabbed a few dozens of the people, dragged them to machines, to cars, and, and dispatched them to police and to other uh, headquarters of uh, uh, other branches of KGB. But actually, they could do very little with these people. When they unfolded these slogans, well, to respect your own constitution, surely not a very big crime, even in the Soviet Union. And, and the slogan which demanded the open, the, uh, open trial on Sinyansky and Daniel was half destroyed by a policeman who tried to wriggle it out of, uh, of one of the members of the demonstration. So when they put it together, it was, we demand the trial on Sinyansky and Daniel. <laughs> so the, the word open disappeared in the middle. So, Actually, nobody was punished except myself and a couple of other guys who were accused of organizing it. Uh, we were sent to psychiatric hospital and we stayed for a few months there uh, and then finally dismissed. So the, the, we've got away with that first demonstration. And of course, it gave a big boost to people's uh, feelings and, uh, and, and uh, courage to go ahead and do something like that. The subsequent several years were the years of protests and arrests. I cannot describe it better than that. So those who would protest will be arrested, then somebody else will protest because these people were arrested and got arrested themselves, and then somebody else will come and protest. And this was a chain reaction which continued for several years. Uh, the authorities were adamant not to stop that, and we were adamant not to stop that. In a way, we succeeded because the authorities didn't feel sufficiently strong to go into an offensive and grab thousands uh, that would be too counterproductive for the government at that time, which tried to make good impression on the West and have extended trade relations and other things. So they couldn't do that, although we didn't know how much they could do. Now, the turning point came somehow in 1968, when it was a culmination of, of, of growth of movement, when we had a chain reaction of thousands of, of people suddenly joining us and being ready to risk and go and protest and do something. It was quite, quite a dangerous moment, and at the same time, it has its own repercussions in, in, in East European countries, particularly in Czechoslovakia. So the decision taken by the Soviet authorities in 1968 to invade Czechoslovakia was as much for the home reasons as much for the foreign reasons. They needed to crush the burdening opposition within the Soviet Union. They knew that if they demonstrate their ruthlessness, once again, to show that nothing can stand in the way of the Soviet authorities, then it will affect the domestic scene as much as it will affect the Czechs. So that's why they did it. Um, but it also brought a new dimension in our, uh, in our movement. It, it, it brought a dimension of national struggles, national problems. By, by implication, the problem of Czechoslovakia, a foreign country being occupied by the Soviet troops for ideological reasons, somehow uh, sort of wakened the people to the problems of dozens and dozens of other uh, minorities and nationalities in the Soviet Union. It's not that these uh, uh, minorities were calm and quiet. Many of them were not, and they, they also had their uh, growing national uh, movement of resistance. Some of these countries, like Baltic countries or western part of Ukraine, had been occupied only at the beginning of World War II, and the armed struggle in them continued, as, as you probably know, till middle 50s. So in, in 60s, they had some kind of a revival like we had in, in Central, in, 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 in Moscow, in, Soviet, in, in, in Russia. They would have burgeoning national movement, which will be more of a cultural, more of a human rights variety type of, of type of a movement, not a violent, not, not an armed resistance anymore. Uh, there were some uh, uh, minorities, some nationalities, which were punished part and parcel in the Soviet Union, like, say, Crimean Tartars, who had been exiled in 1944 uh, from Crimea, from their homeland by Stalin, to Central Asia without right to return and settle in their homeland. 
uh, their uh, problem suddenly became quite important for us and we became aware of these problems. We suddenly had spread into this problem of nationalities and felt sort of united with them. We established contacts with them and from that moment on it was a, a very close cooperation between uh, the national movements and the mainstream human rights movement in the Soviet Union. Now in the 70s we had somewhat a new development, a new danger which threatened our, uh, our movement. Uh, the Soviet authorities realized that by, by uh, repressions alone, they probably would never destroy us. They felt it's not sufficient. Therefore, they came with a new device, uh, which is called, now known under the name of psychiatric abuse for political purposes in the Soviet Union. Now, that wasn't invented in the 70s. It was invented under Khrushchev. Khrushchev, who was probably the last believer in communism among the Soviet leadership, really believed that uh, in due time, in 19, by 1980s, he will have a real communist system established. Therefore, as it goes in the books, in the Marxism, in the real communist society, there should be no criminals, no crime, no oppression, no inequality. And, uh, and he, of course, knew that uh, by that time, uh, he, he would manage to destroy all the crime and, uh, and improve people to such an extent. So he suddenly came up in 50, late 50s, I think in 59, with a statement saying that in the socialist country there could be no enemies of socialism. According to Marxist doctrine, the uh, consciousness is shaped up by the social environment. So once you live in a socialist country, there could be no anti-socialist mentality. Those, he said, who, uh, who are against us are actually mentally ill people. And that was, it wasn't a joke, it was a very serious instruction. After that, they started developing the diagnosis, how to use it against those who disagree. I've got very early into that uh, kind of a treatment in the early 60s. Uh, at that time, the psychiatrists themselves did not organize everything in perfect order, so there were several slips and several loopholes they didn't close at that time, so I've got away uh, uh, from that uh, nearly safely. Uh, others who came later, of course, got in deeper trouble. At that time, they had only two diagnoses. One was widely spread, another was just appearing and, you know, sort of gaining momentum. One was called the paranoid development of personality. Now, what does it mean? It means, as they say, that some individual in due time became so much obsessed with certain ideas which he uh, values very highly, that he is ready to sacrifice his life, his career, uh, his well-being, or that of his relatives, close relatives, for the sake of this idea, which is in psychiatry was termed the super-valued idea. Now, the uh, consequence of this concept are, of course, very difficult for anybody who disagrees with the state. Because normally they will come up and ask you, why did you disagree with the state? If you disagreed with the state, that means that you're in a conflict to, uh, with it. You do not accept their values. You have values of your own, which you value so much, that you are prepared to sacrifice your freedom, your, your well-being, or whatever, for the sake of these ideas. Uh, and uh, there is very little you, you can say about it. If you are in a conflict of the society, with the society, there are only two logically possible conclusions. Either society is wrong or you are wrong. If you say the society is wrong and you are right, surely you are a madman. If you say other way around, then they don't have any problems. Then, 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 then you are supposed to recant and uh, disarm yourself ideologically, as they call it. Uh, now, some people try to wriggle out of this sort of dilemma, saying, like a friend of mine, saying, well, after all, Comrade Lenin also was in conflict with his society, and yet we don't regard him as a madman, do we? Uh, that didn't help him at all, because the only thing he got was the inscription in his history case, in medical case, uh, suffering from mania grandiosa, comparing himself with Lenin. That, that was the only conclusion. Now, but that diagnosis was um, somewhat easy, I would say, because uh, the paranoics are not really mentally ill. It's aberration of development. So therefore, they wouldn't treat you heavily. They wouldn't treat you with heavy medics, uh, medicine. The other diagnosis, which was uh, uh, developing at that time, called sluggish schizophrenia, was much more dangerous. Uh, there was a professor, uh, Snizhnevsky, who developed a doctrine of sluggish schizophrenia. Now, uh, in, 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 in short, uh, 
uh, it meant that there is such a form of schizophrenia which develops so slowly and for so many years that there are no external manifestations of this disease, either in emotional sphere or intellectual sphere, so much so that uh, probably only Snezhnevsky and his disciples could really uh, de establish that the man suffers from it. It's very sluggish schizophrenia. But no matter how sluggish it might be, the treatment was quite severe because it was a schizophrenia and was supposed to be treated. Now, these two diagnoses uh, uh, were in existence at the time when I first uh, got, got in touch with Soviet psychiatry. Later, the sluggish schizophrenia diagnosis became predominant uh, because uh, of its simplicity. All the KGB needed is, uh, was only to send you to somebody who believes in sluggish schizophrenia and they get rid of you. Uh, the, the diagnosis will follow almost automatically. Uh, and because of that uh, convenience, uh, the Snezhnevsky so uh, and his proponents became very much promoted and their doctrine became sort of obligatory in the Soviet psychiatry in due time. Now that was a big danger because I've met many people in my life who would be prepared to risk their life for the sake of ideas or truth or whatever but not that so many people who would be prepared to uh, lose their mind. Uh, in due time it became a, a scare tactic of KGB when they wanted somebody to recant, to crack up and tell them what they want. All they needed to do was only to threaten to these people, well, if you don't cooperate, we will send you to psychiatric hospital. And the people would cooperate. That became quite dangerous. The treatment itself in these psychiatric hospitals was appalling. I used to be there in the early 60s and then in 66 for a rather brief period of time, for a year and a half or at one point and for eight months and another. But the treatment was quite severe anyway. At that time particularly, they would have few drugs used and few restrictive measures they used, most of them quite harmful. Uh, the most simple and, and probably less harmful of all was so-called aminazine, which when injected would uh, uh, act like sedative, would uh, make people sleepy, uh, sort of um, not, not very much in, tact, in, in contact with reality. And if uh, the injections continued, so as long as the injections continue, the individual will be sort of slumbering through. Uh, the, the other uh, was much, much more painful, it was called sulfazine. And it was actually the solution of sulfur in oil. So when injected into human body, it produced the abscess, very high temperature and terrible pain. That was administered uh, for purely punitive reasons. No therapeutic value was ever uh, ascribed to that kind of a treatment. Uh, whenever the doctor wanted to punish somebody for infringement or for violating re internal regulations in the hospital, he would administer that drug and in, it would be administered in proportion according to the degree of uh, violation of instruction or, or rules in it. Uh, the one doctor I've met uh, in 66 would administer three injections, uh, five cubic each, which will be sort of uh, routinely called three to five. Uh, and it would be administered in such a way that human being wouldn't be actually capable of moving head, hand or, 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 or leg for at least a day or two. And if the injections are in use, then it could be, you could be kept in this condition as long as, you, as the doctor wants. Now, uh, the third restrictive measure, which was worst of all, I would say, was called at that time roll-up. Now, roll-up uh, was a, a procedure by which an inmate, uh, particularly a violent inmate, was supposed to be restrained. Uh, it was a very simple procedure. The inmate was simply rolled into a vet, uh, canvas or, or sheets from the heels up to the armpits and left in this condition for a while. When the material start drying, it will shrink and produce a terrible pain and pressure. There was a number of people who died in the, during that procedure and the nurse was supposed to be attending it, keeping the fingers on the pulse of the, of the patient. So if he fainted in, in this roll-up, the roll-up should be sort of opened a bit to give him a breeze and then will be rolled up again. Uh, that would be a normal procedure in, in 60s and some 70s, and up, up to a certain date I will tell you about. Uh, 
Uh, the hospital itself will be a normal, uh, uh, normal prison with the, all the beauties of prison system and restrictions of it, plus the uh, restrictions and punishment uh, uh, peculiar for the psychiatric hospital. The people in charge, apart from guards, will be orderlies, nurses, and doctors. Now, uh, doctors and nurses, since they will be under the uh, auspices of the uh, Ministry of Interior, will be military people. They will be military doctors with the ranks and uniform. The orderlies will be criminals who serve their term for some uh, minor crimes uh, by being in that particular institution. So they were simply serving their uh, uh, term by being orderlies in there. And of course, uh, they, they would treat all the inmates as, uh, uh, as uh, mentally ill people for whom no, nobody would ever punish them. So routinely they would beat inmates, they would take things from them. Uh, if, uh, uh, if uh, an inmate happened to have a warm clothes or something, uh, this orderly is fancy, they will take it from him, they will beat him, and th then they will complain to a nurse saying that this particular inmate became excited, violent, and attacked them. And then the doctor in his term will prescribe certain drugs to this guy. So that's the kind of vicious circle one can get in the place like that. The murder of, of inmates was, I wouldn't say common, but it occurred quite often. Uh, uh, so, as you can see, the place is by no means pleasant, and the, uh, the pressure generated on people in this place was indeed uh, quite dangerous. Uh, our response to that uh, danger, to our movement, was rather traditional. We used publicity in the West. One of my tasks at that time was uh, to collect documentation on, on these cases, uh, uh, to have as much of a cynical uh, medical conclusions, medical papers on that, uh, as I could. Some uh, uh, memoir literature, some, some uh, stories people told me, some kind of investigation to make, particularly on sex cases I knew best. And smuggle it out to the West, send it to World Psychiatric Association with the request to study it and to come up with a certain conclusion. Uh, it's, it so happened that the initial response of psychiatrists was very lukewarm. It was uh, a beginning of detente, and nobody wanted to spoil good relations with the Soviet Union. So the World Psychiatric Association refused to discuss the issue. Uh, and as a result of it, the Soviet authorities felt quite free to punish us. And I've got my 12 years, uh, thanks to that international body, quite easily. Uh, but the ordinary psychiatrists in many countries did not accept uh, the reality so easily. They start campaigning. They organized groups in different countries, groups of rank-and-file psychiatrists who would uh, lobby their respective national psychiatric associations, uh, campaign publicly, lobby within the World Psychiatric Association to come up with stronger uh, condemnations and words. And uh, to my amazement, the campaign suddenly became very successful. I didn't know about that because I was in jail, but uh, as I've learned later, it was sort of on increase year by year. And that probably is the reason why they suddenly decided to get rid of me. The new World Psychiatric Association Congress was scheduled to take place in 1977. So the Soviet authorities decided to get rid of as many hot cases as they could. They released several people from psychiatric hospitals and they found a way of exchanging me. But the campaign was a success. When I came out, I've um, uh, learned how successful it was. And then in 1977, as many of you probably know, the World Psychiatric Association condemned Soviet abuse of psychiatry for political purposes. Later, a few years later, the Soviet uh, delegation actually withdrew from this body under the pressure of, of their colleagues, knowing that uh, unless they withdraw, they will be kicked out anyway. So as it stands now, uh, they are not members of World Psychiatric Association. They changed in some way. They moderated it. They still would imprison in this fashion many ordinary people who have very little chance of becoming known to the West or having some publicity, some defense in the, of, in, in, in the form of public opinion in the West. Uh, they wouldn't touch those who might become celebrities, who might become known in the West, particularly intellectuals. They also changed the treatment to some extent. They dropped this uh, dreadful roll-up uh, tactics. They do not apply it since late 70s.
So uh, quite unexpectedly that was successful, although much later. Now, another stage in the development of, health, of, of um, human rights movement in the Soviet Union came in the form of Helsinki monitoring groups. Now, as you, I'm sure, know, in 1975, the Soviet Union uh, and uh, 34 other countries of Europe, United States and Canada, have signed the Helsinki Accords. Uh, that gave, uh, I wouldn't say it gave hopes to the people inside, because Nobody, as far as I remember, believed that the Soviet Union will respect its own obligations, but it actually made a lot of people anxious to show to, this, to the West that they're going to be taken for a ride. The, the idea was to explain to the West a, 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 every time that the Soviet Union violates its own obligations that, that, that the Soviet Union does that, and uh, every time to show that you cannot uh, sort of rely on their word unconditionally, you cannot trust them, you should do something more Serious. Now, in due time, uh, in 76, 77, uh, a number of Helsinki monitoring groups had been established in the Soviet Union, in Moscow, in Ukraine, in Lithuania, in Georgia, in Armenia. Uh, it became quite uh, a strong movement that created infrastructures, uh, not only the Helsinki groups itself, but also some committees affiliated to it, so like uh, a, a committee for the defense of rights of believers, uh, committees uh, of the, the, the working group to investigate the abuse of psychiatry. There were several uh, public groups, independent public groups, which suddenly felt they can establish themselves and operate uh, legally on the Soviet territory. Now, it could have been a very important development, if not uh, for a rather uh, bad handling of the whole Helsinki process by the Western countries. You might recall that the Helsinki Accord was organized in such a way as to have three baskets, so-called baskets, three parts. One is security, another is uh, cooperation, uh, economic, uh, cultural, scientific uh, cooperation, and the third one is human rights provisions. Now, in the original text of the agreement, it was made clear that all three baskets are equally important uh, and uh, interconnected, and one is sort of impossible without another. Uh, now, when the first cases of violation of human rights were reported uh, uh, by the monitoring groups to the West, and the first review conference occurred in Belgrade, the West actually have taken a very sort of soft position, soft approach, which was formulated at that time by a simple formula, we should not demand too much from the Soviets which was a very strange formula and still strange for me because in my view you should demand as much as it is written down in the agreement. But nevertheless the attitude was not to demand too much and uh, there were no condemnation and not particular pressure on the Soviet authorities to live up to their own obligations. As a result of that the Soviets once again felt much more free to violate it and finally totally ignore it. We know that by now the, most of the members of all these Helsinki monitoring groups are either jailed or exiled. Moreover, about, uh, at least five of them has died in the imprisonment, sometimes under very mysterious circumstances. Some of them were quite young people. Nevertheless, the West still continued to treat this issue as kind of a humanitarian issue without the proper emphasis. The natural thing, natural thing which we, we ex expected from them would be to use the linkage between these baskets, so to speak. That is, in response to the Soviet violation of human rights, the West should impose certain sanctions in the cultural, economic, scientific cooperation. That would affect the Soviets, and that was the essence of the whole agreement. That was never done. The West had never came up with any sanctions in response to the violations of human rights. Instead, uh, the sanctions were finally introduced in 1980 by Carter, 1979 by, by Carter, in response for the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. Well, the occupation of Afghanistan, in my view, is a much bigger issue, and he should have find, uh, found some kind of a more appropriate response. He should have used the sanctions in response for the violation of human rights. He didn't. And that, of course, practically made the whole uh, agreement, the Helsinki Accords, senseless. As a result of it, the Soviet authorities felt they can go into offensive. In 1979, 
uh, we had a turning point as a result of which by the end of the year the new mass repressions have started. Uh, hundreds of people have been immediately imprisoned. Uh, and uh, in this way they managed to destroy most of these infrastructures which were created uh, in the 70s. Uh, the reason why these infrastructures were gone so easy was, I would think, uh, a decision made by many uh, participants in the human rights movement because, the short, because of the short duration of activity, anybody of them could really uh, achieve. Uh, if previously, before 1979, anybody active in this open fashion in one of these public infrastructures could actually be active for a year or even two years before finally being arrested and therefore could manage to do a lot of things during these two years. Now, after 79, the lifespan of anybody's activities uh, in these structures will be as long as three weeks, four weeks at best. So nobody would actually have time to achieve anything by joining this group. And it was more or less decided not to continue with these uh, groups because uh, it wouldn't make much sense. So they were, most of them, disbanded or uh, or not renewed in membership. Usually, uh, the system in our movement will be to replace uh, uh, somebody who is arrested by somebody who just joined it. But in this case, it was decided not to go ahead with it. Of course, as I've already explained, the explanation, uh, the, the reason for this uh, sudden destruction uh, and decrease, uh, the decline in the movement, one of them was the Helsinki Accords and the way it was mishandled by the West, never used properly. But actually there was another reason for that too. The Soviet Union at the same time decided to go into more militaristic, more threatening posture in the world. Uh, they were returning to their tactics of Cold War. So they uh, sort of generated more threat of war in the world, scaring a lot of people in the West, and in doing so, generating a huge so-called peace movement in the, in the West, which which would accept a Soviet definitions uh, of, of peace and, uh, and cooperation. The Soviet would come up with a slogan, something like, the peace is the most important human right. They have uh, concocted this slogan in 1979, 1980, and it was actually published in the Soviet press. Later, a lot of members, uh, participants in the peace movement, accepted it to the letter. So they will be prepared to sacrifice the rights of other people. They would, ex uh, 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 they would accept the crimes, the violations committed by the Soviet Union just for the sake of peace, as they say, as if you can buy peace by this strange tolerance. Uh, let me give you a few examples of how it worked and still works. Uh, let me give you a quote from several sources. One of them, for example, uh, the National Academy of Science in the United States. Now, a number of uh, private scientists in, in America decided to make pressure on the Soviet authorities and terminated their contacts with their Soviet counterparts till the persecution of scientists will be stopped in the Soviet Union. Now, just in the middle of that, and in the middle of hunger strike on which Dr. Sakharov was in Gorky, the National Academy of Science suddenly signed an agreement with the Soviet Academy of Science. Now, how they do justify that? Very simple. Frank Press, the president of American National Academy of Science, written in Washington Post at that time. Despite our continuous concern for Sakharov, there are some issues of such deep importance to the future of mankind that we have felt ne ne necessity to continue talking about them with our Soviet counterparts. In this regard, arms control and international security are certainly of high priority. So we suddenly have that out of three issues, originally in, 75, uh, in 1975 believed to be equal and connected, security, cooperation, and human rights, one issue became more equal than others. The peace and security suddenly became all important uh, to which all other interests have to be subjugated. And that, of course, was the Soviet plan. That was their idea. It's not only the American uh, uh, National Academy of Science which came up with the same thing, with, with such an approach. It suddenly became very fashionable. All kind of uh, public institutions around the world who used to be very sympathetic to human rights problems in the Soviet Union and would issue some statements of support, suddenly have accepted that interpretation of peace uh, 
uh, under which you're supposed to sacrifice people's rights and dignities. Uh, for example, American Bar Association have signed a working agreement with the Soviet, uh, Soviet lawyers, Association of Soviet Lawyers. Actually, as a body who includes a number of people directly responsible for repressions in the Soviet Union. And they justified it by what? By peace. They say, in signing the agreement the, uh, uh, with the uh, Association of Soviet Lawyers, uh, American Bar Association expressed the earnest hope that cooperation between them may, con may contribute to the improvement of relations between the two nations and make an important contribution toward world peace and uh, mutual understanding. So instead of trying to maintain the standards of their own profession and have a certain distance between themselves and, and the criminals, the people who are involved in crimes uh, against humanity, these people suddenly justify their complicity, their contacts uh, by the issues of peace, as if by talking to some Soviet stooges they can actually secure a kind of a peace in the world. Uh, it, it went even further. The organization called uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, there is such an organization, uh, brought to the United States a year ago a number of Soviet, psychiat a number of Soviet uh, uh, doctors, among them psychiatrists who are personally responsible for committing sane people into uh, uh, lunatic asylums. Uh, they brought, for example, to California, and that's how I know it, they brought it actually to a place where I am working to Stanford, Dr. Marat Vartanyan, who is legally responsible for keeping people in, uh, uh, sane people in, in insane institutions because he is Deputy Minister of Health in the Soviet Union with responsibility for psychiatry. He actually also was personally involved in diagnosing a sane man, diagnosing a sane man as insane for political reasons. He diagnosed Plush. And Plush now lives in Paris and uh, uh, his sanity is well established by psychiatrists in the West. When we protested to these so-called physicians for social responsibility, uh, uh, saying that why do you bring the equivalent of Soviet Dr. Mengele to talk about the peace, what kind of idea is that? They answered to us, and I quote, also the mistreatment of dissidents is repugnant to us. It won't result in the extinction of the species as the nuclear issue will. There is no issue that is worse the annihilation of life on Earth. Now, that is the most dangerous attitude, which brings uh, enormous harm, not only to your society, not only to your values, but to us, to our uh, movement, to our uh, appearing public opinion, independent public opinion, to those people who risk their lives and freedom to make the Soviet Union a safer place and less dangerous for you. Because if that is so, then for the sake of so-called peace on Soviet conditions, we should forget about any past, uh, present, and future crimes and shake hands with them and accept whatever conditions they impose on us. That is a betrayal, a direct betrayal of values, your values and ours. Now, let me conclude by saying uh, that the issues of uh, internal oppression and external aggression are inseparable, and that's why the peace movement and some other people who try to interpret it separately are wrong. The Soviet Union is aggressive precisely because it's closed society and because it had to keep in control, in obedience, uh, huge multitudes of people and nations. That, that is exactly the reason why they are forced to become more aggressive, to become uh, stronger than they are. Uh, to always keep the world in the, under the threat of, uh, of war. The threat of war in due time in the Soviet development, ideological development, became a substitute for belief in communism. When people ceased to believe in communism, the only thing which could keep them in obedience, in control in the Soviet society was a constant threat of war, which was generated quite deliberately by the Soviet Union. They also need the threat of war in order to keep in a certain subdued state the West which they are scared of, and to actually get whatever they can in terms of credits and technology. When the threat of war comes to the uh, very high level of tension, the Soviets actually come along and sell it in exchange for technology and credits and declare, pro proclaim detente for a while before they once again go back to the previous pattern. Uh, so.
What will happen in the future with the human rights movement? How much is it, it is affected by the current decline? It did destroy the superstructures, as I said, and it became much more difficult for anybody to do something, but it didn't destroy the whole movement. As far as we can judge, the spread of summers that continues, and it suddenly affected the areas where it, in previous years, was not known. Uh, we suddenly received, by our ways, some summers that in the areas where we're not known to be involved in it. There are some other manifestations, some other signs of developing of human rights movement in a more, uh, in a more concealed fashion. I don't think it will be destroyed because it was created by the problems of the Soviet society, by the Soviet uh, rigid ideological uh, 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 fetters, and as long as they are existing, the movement will continue. The, the people always ask me how many are dissidents, how influential they are. I want you to understand it's not a question of numbers, it's a question of example. It's like in that demonstration from which it started 20 years ago, there was a handful of people doing that and thousands watching. And that is exactly what happens with dissidents. A lot of people watch it, and if you survive, then they might join it. It's like during the uh, solidarity in Poland, the attitude in the Soviet Union among many people was, would they survive? Would they manage to liberate themselves? If they do, then we probably will try it. So it's a question of somehow remo removing this mental block that the changes are always only for worse. It's a, it's, a, it's a question of believing that you can escape from that system, you can change it. Let me finish by telling you a story which is very revealing uh, and answering the question how many dissidents are. I remember in 1977 I was discussing it with a good friend of mine, a Polish dissident, uh, Adam Michnik, who is right now in jail and uh, later became advisor to Solidarity and member of core committee. He was temporarily abroad for half a year. And we discussed it in Paris in one of the cafes, and uh, he asked me um, in a rather low voice in between us, tell me how many dissidents are in the Soviet Union? And I was rather diplomatic saying, well, I think it's enough. It's not many, but it's, it's enough for the time being. And he said, well, in Poland there are so few, there are such conformists, these polls, it's awful. I don't believe anything would ever happen. He went back to Poland within three years after that. They had a spectacular appearance of solidarity with 13 million members uh, marching under the banners of solidarity who previously were regarded by my friend as conformists. So let me finish on that, leave you with that thought and open the floor for questions. Thank you. Microphones are working. Uh, we'd ask you to step to the microphones uh, to entertain questions. There is one on this stairway and another on this one. How do you view the situation of human rights outside the Soviet uh, sphere of influence? And more precisely, how do you view what's happening in South America? Because, as you said, everything is interrelated. So. Uh, do you think there is, how, how do you view the spread of communism or of, let's say, left-wing movements in Central America? Let's say, first of all, it's dangerous for the countries themselves, including uh, the countries of Cuba and Nicaragua. My good friend, very close friend, a Cuban poet, Armando Valadares, who spent 22 years in Castro's jails, uh, can testify to that. Castro today is probably the most uh, ruth ruthless uh, dictator you can imagine, the most ruthless system. Uh, he was tortured severely. I, I wouldn't describe you the tortures he underwent because he just finished writing his book and the book is going to be published and I all urge you all to buy it and to read it. 
because I've seen a lot in my life, and even I had some kind of uh, uh, creeps dying, uh, going down my back when I read it. Uh, that, that is the model the communists are trying to establish in Central America or wherever they come, wherever they go. As far as Nicaragua is concerned, we already have a well advanced a communist stronghold there. In 1983, I've spent a week investigating the situation in Nicaragua. We went to Venezuela with a number of uh, uh, prominent Europeans, writers, uh, public figures, and we had very wide hearings on the subject. We had in front of us hundreds of Nicaraguans testifying about the situation in Nicaragua. There were hum uh, human rights activists, there were lawyers, there were trade unionists, there were different national ethnic groups like Mosquito Indians, like Jews. I've never heard it, but they've explained the small Jewish community in Managua had been completely destroyed. They just left the country. The man, a Jewish businessman from Managua who testified in front of us said, you know, Managua, the, the Nicaragua is probably the happiest country in the world. It has no Jewish problem because all the Jews left after their synagogue was destroyed. Uh, these facts are not very widely known. I have a habit of establishing facts before making conclusions, unlike some other people. We also send a couple of our friends to go inside Nicaragua and investigate it on the spot secretly. We had a friend of mine who traveled across Nicaragua secretly, brought out the videotapes, the notes, photographs, interviews with the people. He testified and brought this uh, material to us as a proof of genocide against mosquito Indians in Nicaragua. Uh, it, these materials were finally published in Europe, even, even by very left-wing newspapers like Liberation in Paris, because they were objective facts. You couldn't really deny them. As far as the development concerned, we all know how it goes. And unfortunately, my judgment is that the situation in Nicaragua goes exactly by the books, exactly like Lenin predicted it. Apparently, they follow it from the books. They go from stage to stage. And when people here became deceived by it, they simply don't know history enough to understand what's happening there. For example, I've always hear accusations saying, well, the Contras have uh, what they call the extra, uh, um, the former Somoza guards in their ranks. Now, people don't know that the same accusation was always leveled against any uh, forces which tried to oppose the Soviet uh, communist regime in the Soviet Union. They will be always accused of being the children of uh, uh, of uh, capitalists, the children of uh, land uh, owners, although they might be as, as much peasants as anybody else. Moreover, that in any war of that time, the military specialists are used by both sides. Trotsky actually used the Tsarist officers and Red Army because they were the only military educated people anybody could lay hand on. So there were more white officers in the Red Army during the Civil War than it was on, on the side of, of white armies. Uh, and this accusation becomes ridiculous when you know this history, when you know how it goes. For example, they speak about the uh, elections in Nicaragua. Well, Nicaraguans uh, describe the election as free and fair. Now, it is enough for me to know that the Nicaragua was created what they call the Committees for the Defense of Revolution, to understand what they're doing, because it's exactly a model they've done in every country. It's a, it was called the Block Committees in Eastern Europe, or the Committees of Poorest, uh, uh, whatever in so-and-so area, their target, their, uh, uh, their tactic is uh, a scare, a terror uh, in their particular location. They watch and observe everybody and they wouldn't allow anybody to do something they don't want to. They will be controlling it through the mob scare, the mob uh, tactics. And that's exactly like they do in Nicaragua. So how can you expect people in that conditions to have fair and free elections? It's ridiculous. They do not deny they are communists, they do, do not deny they go by the books. Now, we have that discussion about contra aid in, in, in the United States, and I'm sure you discuss it here. One of the uh, objections, one of the arguments of the opponents of it is that we should first go and negotiate with them. Now, let me tell you on the basis of what I know about the communist system, that it's simply senseless to negotiate with them at this point. What are you going to negotiate with them? The dismantle of the communist system? I don't remember a single case in history when communists, under the negotiations, decided to dismantle themselves. They are not Marcus, they are not Duvaliers, they wouldn't go to Haiti under the negotiations with somebody. It's ridiculous. So there is no way at this point 
you can handle Nicaragua, but, but by supporting the, uh, the, uh, uh, the opposing forces. There is nothing left, unfortunately. Just one small follow-up. How do you explain the mechanics of the enormously widespread pro-Sandinista movement here in Montreal and everywhere else in North America, including Western Europe? Well, it differs, <laughs> it differs from country to country. I deal with this issue, for example, in Europe quite often. Uh, it's quite often just ignorance. It's quite often just wishful thinking. I know the people, particularly in Europe, where you have a number of socialists, and socialists are as much a part of Western society as anybody else, who still believe in their naivety that if socialism failed in China and failed in Moscow and failed everywhere, there is still a possibility for good socialism somewhere in a very far remote area, probably primitive tribe will be living the socialist utopia. And they always are very eager to believe in it. So whenever they hear about some kind of a socialism in a remote country, they always uh, uh, want to believe that finally that's an ideal of socialism coming up. They don't want to believe that it's manipulated as much as anything else, that it's going to be as ruthless, ruthless as any other revolution of socialist type. That's just wishful thinking. That's the same people who were supporting Maoism, you know, they were supporting uh, the Soviet communism in the 20s and 30s, honestly believing that they're supporting the best uh, model of the future society. That is one of the explanations. There are some other explanations too. There are some people who are very narrow-minded and very sh have a very short vision of things. They think about the immediate steps. They don't think about two steps in advance. They think now to be involved in any kind of war is awful. It's a it's violation of our values. They don't think about the millions of people whose homes will be destroyed, who will be running, trying to find the new place of living for themselves, who, whose families will be destroyed. It's like people who were objecting to uh, American involvement in Indochina in the old time. And now don't take on themselves responsibility for all these both people who run away from there. I call these people irresponsible. In my view, intellectually, they are responsible for murder of half Cambodian population. That's what I believe. There's been a lot of attention today in the United States these days uh, concerning the supporters of Lyndon LaRouche, who have claimed that the Soviets have infiltrated Western society at its highest levels, even going so far as to label uh, people like Walter Mondale, for instance, a conscious agent of Soviet influence. What is your opinion of such reactionary statements? Do they have any basis in fact? Well, I think, I think it's as much of ignorance as the opposite st standpoint. Uh, these people don't understand the way the communism works. It doesn't work necessarily through paid agents. It, pays through, it, it works through what Lenin called uh, once useful idiots. They are not paid. <laughs> I have three short questions. The first one, um, according to the television here, which we see quite often, one might, might have an impression that the people in the Soviet Union believe that they are free. Is that true or not? Uh, well, if you ask them, as the television does very often, come with a camera in the street, and ask them, do you, do you believe you're free? Of course they will say, yes, I'm free. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but if you try to talk to them privately and, uh, you know. The next question is, back in the 60s, I believe, um, the people used to talk about some friction between Red Army and the party, and especially General Zhukov. Um, and some people were of the opinion that the only change in the Soviet Union could be brought in by the Red Army. Was that, in fact, uh, such a thing? No, unfortunately not. It was, it was a dangerous period, you're quite right, during Marshal Zhukov time, because there was a certain clash in, in the leadership. But it wasn't much of an army, it was just the top leadership in the military who were in playing cards with, with other leadership. It, the army in the Soviet Union is, is as much of, as a part of the society as anybody else. They are basically treated by the party 
as the specialists, the experts, very much like engineers. Their opinion will be uh, asked only when a very precise technical military question must be established. For example, how much you need uh, ammunition or how much troops you need to occupy Afghanistan. But they would not be asked, should we or should we not occupy Afghanistan? That question would never ask uh, the military. So the military have a, a rather, uh, rather secondary role in the Soviet establishment. Would they ever become more powerful? Well, I have no answer to that question. It might so happen. I mean, it very much depends on development of events in the Soviet Union, in the empire as such. Uh, it might happen, but so far we don't have any uh, manifestations or indications of that. Uh, was it your question? That's right. And uh, one more question. You probably read the book, uh, The Liberators, by Viktor mm. Suvarov. Mm. Is there, uh, you, th you believe that uh, what he described in this book is true? Yes. It's a very good book. I've, uh, not only I've read it, I've reviewed it for the Times in London, and I actually have written an introduction to it for French edition. Uh, it's a very good book. If those of you who didn't read it should. It's called uh, The Liberators. The author is Viktor Suvorov. Uh, it's a pseudonym, it's not a real name. He is a defector. He used to be the GRU officer, GRU officer in military intelligence, who defected to the West and he cannot disclose his identity. Uh, he's a very interesting young man with a lot of knowledge of military affairs. He used to be a junior officer in uh, armor during the occupation of Czechoslovakia, which he describes also as a part of this book, The Liberators. Uh, it, it gives you a brilliant description of relations in the Soviet army. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, an issue recently debated very much in Canada is uh, the problem of uh, Canadian participation in the Strategic Defense Initiative. Uh, as you uh, probably know, the Canadian government decided, at least for the time, time being, not to participate uh, uh, in this research program. Mm -hmm. uh, Canadian bishops, Catholic bishops, in their wisdom, um, and they seem to be great experts in those matters, they also uh, pronounce themselves against it. Now, uh, many of us are seriously concerned that this is an issue which may be of very serious importance in trying to exercise pressure on the Soviet Union uh, to implement some changes. I wonder what would be your opinion about it. Well, speaking of uh, Canadian uh, uh, decision not to participate in something, uh, it reminds me of uh, these uh, peace groups who would proclaim a nuclear free zone in their village and believe that in doing so they protected themselves against any aggression or threat or whatever. Uh, actually, in doing so, uh, I must say, uh, Canadians expose themselves to much bigger pressure of the Soviets. They usually increase the pressure on the weak. The tactics of the Soviet Union is very simple. They try to sort of feel a weak link and then to increase the pressure on it. So whenever you show any weakness in your reserve or in your resolve to defend yourself or whatever, you just invite their pressure and nothing else. And you might be in, in a worse position as a result of it than anybody, than say Norway, who joined NATO and, and supports it. Uh, uh, speaking of SDI and uh, the implications of it, I am not uh, uh, a physicist, uh, and I am not in a position to tell you how effective it will be as the as a defense system. My expertise is slightly different. Uh, I can tell you what effect it will have on the Soviet Union. Uh, and it will have a considerable e effect. If nothing else, in order to catch up and to keep uh, the competition successfully with the United States on this issue, the Soviet system, the Soviet regime, would be obliged to give more liberties, more freedom to their scientific community. They actually did the same in the uh, late 40s, the early 50s, when Stalin needed a crash program on, on creating the nuclear forces. In order to do that, they had to appoint people according to their merits, their uh, scientific abilities, and not according to the loyalty to the Communist Party, uh, and give them much more freedom. That's how we have Sakharov now, who uh, under other conditions would never would reach such a high position in the Soviet society. In order to do that with SDI, the Soviet system would be obliged to do even more. Uh, it, it's not, uh, first we know that it, uh, it is behind the West, 
in the high technology probably for 15, maybe 20 years, and it had to revise a lot in their own economy in order to catch up in this very important field in order to be, uh, to be, to be in a good position to compete. Uh, this is actually one of the reasons why the Soviet Union uh, this year announced that they are going to have certain economic reforms. The economic reforms which might have quite important implications for the Soviet population. Gorbachev making his famous five and a half hours speech in the party congress have closed very close, he came very close to proclaiming new economic policies, the NAP in the Soviet Union. He didn't do that, but he came very close to that. Uh, he speaks now about more incentive to the people, more initiative given to the local enterprises, even introducing uh, some kind of uh, changes in agriculture which are comparable to what Chinese are doing. Why? Not because he became so altruistic, but because the Soviet production declined very steadily, reaching zero, and some people say even negative growth of GNP, uh, being terribly behind in high, high tech, with the industrial equipment being obsolete for 70-75%, uh, and they cannot, they cannot produce enough in order to compete with the West. Another consideration which relates to the question asked before, another reason why they need suddenly such a dramatic change in their economic system is that they cannot uh, sustain the burden of their empire anymore. And their empire is not just a stable thing, it's something which must expand in order to survive. The cost of this expansion and empire is astronomical and going higher and higher. At the moment it is assessed to be about $12 billion a year is going to be even higher. And they cannot sustain this kind of uh, burden anymore unless they produce really uh, in an intensive way. Now, in order to produce, as they speak about it right now, in order to modernize their economy and make their, uh, 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 their industry uh, efficient, they must uh, sacrifice some parts of party control over the economic life. And they know it. Now, the question is very interesting. In order to continue spread of the communism abroad, they have to sacrifice parts of it inside of, of the country, or other way around. That's the choice they're confronted with, uh, and, and Gorbachev makes it very clear in his speech. That's, that's a problem, and we are going to do that. Now, of course, it's a big question how far they will go in their uh, reforms. Of course, they don't want to go too far. They want to have some intensification within the system given to them. But, uh, uh, I don't believe that it's going to happen within the system, without uh, changes, structural changes in, in their society, they cannot really go into the intensive production. So what we're talking about right now is how far the Soviet uh, government will go in dismantling the party uh, control over the country. And it will directly be, uh, will be directly related to how, how big a pressure you generate on them. Since their interest in modernizing their economy is in competing with the West and expanding their empire further and maintaining it, you should make, accordingly, a more tough competition, more expensive competition, and more expensive the expansion in the third world. If you do that, then the incentive for the Soviet regime to go into a more dramatic change in its economy is very big, provided, of course, the West once again wouldn't come up and give them credits, technology, and everything free. That would kill any reform in the Soviet Union. So that explains you the place of SDI as I see in, in, in the influencing of the Soviet society. Testing? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to find out basically how you feel about capitalism because my understanding is that it's largely responsible for a lot of human rights violations around the world as well. Uh, repression of workers, etc. And like a case like well, Brazil or South Africa, I mean it's my understanding that apartheid could be stopped tomorrow, but the fact that France, the United Kingdom, Canada, USA are making too much money there to want to end it. I mean they make a lot of money there. You've told us tonight that communism isn't the answer. I'd just like to know how you feel about capitalism and, and the fact that it violates human rights as well in 
expansion of markets, etc.? Well, uh, as far as the capitalism concerned, I didn't actually find the pure capitalism in your society anymore. It probably was uh, the way of life in, in late 19th century. Uh, now, in every society I've lived in, there are certain uh, restraints exercised by some public institutions. In Europe, those of you who lived or have been in Europe know how much the power of what you call capitalism is restricted by power of trade unions. So these two forces seem to uh, counterbalance each other to such an extent as not to allow either side to exercise excessively its power or to become abusive. Uh, if, as far as the, some of the developing countries concerned, like you mentioned uh, Brazil and uh, some other countries, certainly they need a more uh, de democratic development in their countries before they can avoid the worst abuses in their societies. Uh, let's remember that uh, these countries like Brazil or Argentina or uh, some others in the, re in the same area uh, turned to democracy only very recently. The public institutions still not, not very much developed in them as far as I can judge. Uh, and I'm sure that in due time this problem uh, in the way appearing in front of the society will be solved by it by the ways, by the democratic ways I've mentioned. One of them, and I believe, uh, will be the creation of trade unions in these countries with uh, certain protective power given to them. Uh, as far as the South Africa concerned, I'm not a, a great expert on that. I've read a few articles and few books on the subject. I'm not quite sure that you're correct, your assessment is correct when you say that apartheid exists only because France, England, or United States once makes profits over there. It's uh, by far a more complicated issue, as far as I can judge. Uh, it, it looks, uh, it looks uh, that it couldn't be done very quickly because of the uh, uh, inequality and injustice existing in that country for too long. So, and uh, uh, in my experience, it's always better to have a slow improvement than a quick explosion, which might be too bloody. So I wouldn't advocate very hasty measures uh, in South Africa, uh, particularly violent measures, because uh, we can't imagine uh, what tragedy might ensue as a result of it. But of course, the due pressure should be applied to apartheid and uh, to their system to go along the line of reforms, introducing more and more of elements of equality and democracy into their society. Uh, with regard to uh, the SDI um, implications that have been brought up, I find it rather interesting that it was uh, two United States generals during the period of time of 1977 in the National Academy Association of Science magazine, Science, who principally brought up the advent of particle beam weapons, at which time it was refuted greatly through the uh, international press that such a thing existed within the Soviet Union in terms of research and organization. So uh, it seems uh, what I'd like to bring up as a point of information that one really uh, doesn't know who put the cart before the horse in that particular initiative. Yeah. Uh, however, it has caused severe um, pressures both on the United States and the Soviet Union in terms of uh, economic allocations uh, of their resources. And seeing as it's uh, rather evident at this period of time that the Soviet Union is facing severe economic constraints it uh, perhaps would be a good period of time to uh, take action in terms of uh, the West's pressure on uh, that particular uh, economic entity, namely the Soviet Union, in terms of uh, gaining structural differences or structural yeah. uh, progression. Yeah. I would like to ask you at this time, what type of structural progressions would you suggest in that particular nation? Well, some, some of the suggestions are already made by the current leadership. They have already moved somewhat, edged toward uh, the elements of market economy in the Soviet economy. They do not proclaim it as such. They, they are very cautious in their pronouncements because surely the party mechanism will be very much against it, although they know there is no otherwise, there is no way to survive otherwise. So it's very cautiously worded. Gorbachev in his speech actually came even to sort of endorsing private initiative, private, private enterprise to some extent when he says, uh, we shouldn't blame, we shouldn't cast a shadow of, uh, of, uh, of contempt on the people who 
uh, who work individually, he says. He doesn't say private enterprise. Uh, so he is inclined to think about it. He wouldn't go by, by his own volition that far, because that means effectively a loss of power by the Communist Party. Uh, but the necessity, the economic necessity, will move them further and further. They also, they said several things. For example, in agriculture, he says that the emphasis will be given to the family-based productive link, uh, a small unit to which the land and the machinery will be rented in long term, and who would be taxed in lump tax rather than in progressive way, that is, the quota of, of, uh, 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 of uh, uh, of delivery to the state of the goods produced will be established once and forever and not corrected. All produced in excess of it will be uh, the property of these people and they can sell it either in a market system or to the state uh, uh, on the price they will determine. Th that's one of the very important issues uh, because it effectively liberates agriculture which, which used to operate like uh, in old uh, serfdom system on the basis of people being forced to work on so-called collective farms uh, with very little payment or no payment at all uh, and would not really enjoy the, the fruits of their labor. So that's a very big move. Uh, of course, it, 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 it also involves a lot of changes which the Soviet leadership doesn't want to, achieve, uh, to, to have. For example, Gorbachev says about necessity to have price formation uh, uh, being more flexible uh, and more market-oriented. Now, he cannot introduce this thing immediately, because if he does, then the power of the Communist Party will be lost forever. You, you cannot rule a country by both party and marketplace. That doesn't work. People become promoted either according to their merits, productivity, efficiency, or according to their loyalty to the Communist Party. Now, if that happens, they don't, the, the, the Soviet leadership at the moment does not understand the implications of what happens, or at least doesn't want to understand that. Uh, in due time, they will discover that the more efficient the economy becomes, the less powerful becomes the party. The party will start to disintegrate, uh, like it does in China, very efficiently. And, of course, at a certain moment, the question will come, uh, would they continue or would they stop? Now, that would entirely depend entirely on the behavior of the West. Of course, the tendency of the Communist Party will be to stop that development, unless the demand for this change is very high unless the competition with the West becomes very high, unless the cost of empire becomes progressively uh, too high for them to handle, unless they are always threatened with the loss of empire uh, as, as the lever, uh, leverage of pressure on them to introduce the internal changes. They know it very well. They cannot afford themselves to lose external empire because it will have a revert momentum, a sort of reverse tidal wave which will go the other way. And if you have a few examples of the communist countries collapsing in the third world, surely it's going to affect Eastern Europe. And if it does affect Eastern Europe, Europe surely it's going to affect the many nationalities inside of the Soviet Union. So they know it's a powder keg. They cannot play with that. And in order to save that position, they would sacrifice a lot in their internal, uh, internal changes, internal power. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I wanted to raise uh, the question of the danger of uh, a new world war. Uh, a few years ago, when uh, Alexander Sarzhenitsyn was asked uh, by BBC uh, what he thinks about uh, uh, the danger of a third world war, he said, uh, my friends, uh, this war already happened and uh, the free world lost it. So uh, the people were a bit surprised and said, how come? Well, he said, well, since 1945, uh, Soviet Union added to uh, its bloc about 20 countries mm -hmm. on, on almost all continents. Mm -hmm. So if you want to talk about uh, world war, so let's talk about the fourth one. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't think Soviet Union needs it yeah. and will never start it because it can do it without world war. You know, these so-called yeah. liberation movements in Africa, for example, you know, yeah. very effectively than one country after another, you know. 
is is becoming a part of uh, of Soviet Empire. Sure. You know. Yeah, so I agree I, with that. Do, do you agree with it? Certainly, I agree with that. It's uh, uh, the Soviet Union does not need a war. It's a very big misconception uh, which exists in the West uh, through ignorance, through uh, habits to live in secure and, and safe life. Uh, they are scared by the specter of it, but they don't know how realistic it is. Uh, the Soviets need even less, uh, the war, even less than you do. Uh, let me just explain to you what, what might happen if, if the war starts. If it is a conventional war, we might recall, may recall, that at the beginning of World War II, several million of people uh, came over to Germans uh, from the Soviet side, even without knowledge of what the German regime is about. Now, if you have a conflict with the democratic world, the uh, wave of defection certainly is going to be higher because people would know where they're going. Uh, uh, that's one thing. Uh, the uh, war which will continue for a while will become too expensive for the Soviet economy. How long the Soviet and efficient economy can sustain a military effort on a great scale? Not for very long. In the last war, as we know, uh, they were saved by the land lease program, by the very extensive economic uh, assistance from the allied countries. Uh, in, in the war with democracy, they are unlikely to have it. Uh, even less attractive is the prospect, prospect of nuclear war for the Soviet Union. If they need anything from the West, it's a good technology, credits, but not the uh, huge stretch uh, of char, charred land, charcoal land. They, they need something uh, living there and not the dead desert. So they don't need to destroy it. Uh, even if they sustain several explosions of nuclear weapons in their own territory, it will be the end of their system because it's very neatly organized, centralized system of control. Once disrupted, it would not, uh, uh, it would not survive it. It will disintegrate into many parts. So they don't need it at all. They don't need war. They need a threat of war. And the threat of war is something which keeps them going. As much as they don't need peace, they need a struggle for peace. That is the, that is the weapon they use. Well, I don't know much about the Canadian participation. I know that uh, a lot of uh, uh, other countries do that, and uh, I know that a lot of public groups do that without even understanding what they're doing. You see, the, uh, the motive of these people is unquestionably very good. They want to help nation in distress. But through their ignorance, they help uh, the oppressive government against the nation which, which suffers. They do deliver this help not to the people of Ethiopia, but to the government, which is using it to give it to those whom they want to give or to force them to be relocated in another area. Uh, that is something like, uh, like the West has uh, helped uh, Russia in the 20s uh, when Lenin used that help in order to establish his authority in the Soviet territory. It's amazingly accurate. If you read this, the history of 20s and how it was done with American help, very honest, very generous American help, you will be amazed. People of that time who were involved in it on the American side didn't understand it. Those on the Soviet side knew it. They said, well, with this, hope, with this help, probably three and not five million people are going to die, but at this time they will be selected and not, uh, and not uh, at random. Uh, and, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, the degree of responsibility of the people uh, who contribute indiscriminately to, for the help of, uh, of uh, Ethiopia is amazing. They should have known where their money are going and how they are channeled. And unless they know it, they shouldn't do it. You know, it's not good enough in our time just to come up and say, we are the world, we are the people, and in this capacity, <laughs> in this capacity we have a right to be ignorant. I mean, that, that's not good enough. Well, I, I think it's very irresponsible of them to do that. I, I don't know the degree of their involvement. I'm, I'm not following the story. But if they are, it's very irresponsible. They should be insisting, if they want to help people, they should insist on distributing this food 
to those who are hungry on their own decision, not on the decision of a communist government in Addis Ababa. Yeah, there are two defectors uh, from last year, very two different situations, but one is Oleg Gordievsky and the other is Vitaly Yurchenko. Since last year, I haven't heard any news about them whatsoever. Do you have any insights on either one of them? Well, actually, Yurchenko was recently shown on American television. There was a report in American press that he was executed. Because of that, the Soviets decided to show him to American reporters in Moscow. He was shown, he was, uh, uh, he didn't look very happy, but uh, he was alive. Uh, well, the face was the same. The face was distinctly the same. And he talked to reporters. So was he moving? It's a good chance that he was alive. But it does mean that he will stay alive, because the practice usually, and I, I've met few people who got, uh, who returned to the Soviet Union and got in jail, the usual practice is to wait several years even to give them a chance to show themselves to Soviet public, to work for propaganda, to explain how awful the capitalism is and how rotten it is for the people. And then in due course, when the dust settles down, they will be picked up and uh, uh, meet my colleagues somewhere in, in, in Ural Mountains. So that, that's how it happens usually. In his case, actually, he has a very good chance to be executed because he was a uh, very high-ranking uh, KGB officer.